the dreaded chargeback, the bane of the existence of any business that takes credit cards for payment. In this week's video, we are going to be talking to expert Brian Manning on how to not just fight chargebacks, but to prevent them in the first place. So stick around. Hey out there, welcome back to Wedding Industry Law. My name is Rob, I'm a wedding industry attorney, and in this week's video, it's all about chargebacks, fighting chargebacks, preventing chargebacks. What is a chargeback? But we're not doing that alone. We have an expert back on the program again. His name is Brian Manning over at Bank Card Sales. He is the expert in this realm, so I defer to his knowledge. And Brian Manning has helped thousands of businesses just like yours navigate the world of processing payments. And I encourage everybody out there to check out his website at bankcardsales.com. Um, and his information will be in the show notes. And without further ado, let's really get into this because we are, we are going to learn a lot in this video. And welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, for those that might not know, we had Brian on the program maybe a couple episodes back uh, last year at the end of 2021. Uh, talking about surcharges and and how we can possibly either pass that along to clients or um, kind of do investigations on maybe finding service providers that charge less. So I loved that because that's information that I've always wanted to know about. So I was like, Brian, you got to come back because he's the guru with this stuff. And, and this week, it's all about chargebacks. So the scenario that I present to you, Brian, so that way we can have kind of context for the conversation is oftentimes in the wedding and event industry, the business owner, the wedding professional will take um, a deposit, a retainer, some type of money that typically will not go back if the client chooses to cancel the event for reasons within their control. Um, somebody sleeping with somebody else, so they're not going to get married. Maybe they don't like each other anymore, that type of thing. And then what happens is that the, right. the, the client who's paid with a credit card is now disputing the charges. So that's kind of the setup because, I mean, I'm sure there are other instances in which, you know, maybe they didn't do a good job and that's what the dispute is. But in reality, most of the time, it's about that piece of, it's about the money that is quote unquote unearned because the event's not going forward. So- right. Can you kind of walk us through this with really the first question, Brian, being what technically is a chargeback? Like technically what is happening when there is a chargeback? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so really you you already kind of defined it a little bit. One of the best words would just be a dispute. A chargeback is, is a dispute. It's a disagreement between the business and the cardholder, the, the consumer. So you know, in that regard, it's it's obviously very different than a voluntary refund or, you know, just a return of, of services and everything. So it's the customer going to their bank or credit card company and, and saying, I didn't get what I paid for or the dollar amount wasn't correct or there's a whole list of reasons why. But in, in short, they're, they're saying, you know, I don't want to pay for this because of X reason. So it's a it's a disagreement in short. Okay. And so what happens then in terms of, uh, I know that the money shifts, but can you elaborate where the money goes? Like it goes from the, um, the, the business's account to where, while the dispute right. is being resolved. So when the customer files the dispute, then the, the, the chargeback process starts. And what happens immediately is then the merchant services provider, the merchant account provider, will then go and debit the money back out of the business's account while it's in a, essentially an, a holding phase or an intermediary phase that'll last on average around 30 days or so to, um, you know, to go through the entire process. So the customer doesn't get the money back immediately, nor does the business get to keep it. It goes into the the middle, if you will, where the merchant account provider has control of it and then essentially hears both sides of the story through the chargeback process. So essentially the, cu the, the, the customer of the business is going straight to the merchant services provider and saying, give me my money back 
or I want my money because X, Y, Z happened. And then that money is kind of put on hold. I know that, I mean, with lawyers, we're not allowed to take money oftentimes. We have to put it into a special account called an IOLTA account, which we cannot access. And so I guess it goes kind of, it's the similar process where the money goes um, into an account that nobody, nobody can touch until there's some type of resolution. So can you, right. can, can you walk us through then typically the timetable um, what all is involved in that process. And then we'll kind of get into some, some, I guess, bullet points on trying to defend yourself or for lack of a better word, fighting um, the right. chargeback itself. Yeah. So when, so as far as the, again, when the process starts, uh, the business owner will get a notification most often in the mail. And then if there is an online account as well, which is very common anymore nowadays, it'll also be listed in a, in, you know, under the statements tab or under a special tab that says there's a, a chargeback filed. So you can track it, you can, you know, log in and, and uh, present your side of the story. So as the business owner, then you're going to get receive the notification and then be asked to provide you know, contract details, all of the, again, your side of the story type of stuff, the, the dollar amount, the agreement, you know, what your understanding of the, of, of the contract is going to be. And you'll be able to present that and send it back, back into the merchant services company who is uh, essentially once again, facilitating the, the chargeback process for both sides. And, and, and this could be wrong, but in my anecdotal experience, I feel like when there is a, a doubt or a tie, at, and I could be wrong about this, but typically the tie goes to the to the business. If, as long as you, as long as the business owner has presented some semblance or scintilla of evidence of a contract and that they did right, the merchant services provider kind of doesn't want to be in the middle of a fight. Now I could be wrong about that. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I would actually say that ge generally speaking, of course, there's always exceptions and each case certainly is unique, but generally the, the chargeback process <clears throat> originated to, to favor the consumer. Mm -hmm. It was a consumer protection uh, measure more than it was something that would favor the, the merchant or the business and just so that they could automatically get paid or whatever. The, um, so it, it, it does favor the consumer a little bit, but again, that does depend on some variables like card type and, and you know, the, the uh, perhaps the industry that you're in. And then, in, like you said earlier, it, was it a hold? Was it an instant delivery of a product like in a restaurant example, but in the wedding industry where there's a down payment that's held for a period of time, all of those variables get taken into, into consideration because again, with merchant accounts, there's an underwriting process or at least an algorithm that they're following uh, that's that's tied to risk. Well, that's a great segue, Brian. Thank you for that. So let's talk about that then. So with regard to those variables, how can we as a wedding and event professionals put more of those variables on our side to ultimately be successful in fighting that chargeback? Yeah. So to, to start off, uh, it, it starts with with communication as if I were to give like one broad over overarching thing, it starts with proper communication and proper setup from, from the very outset of entering into the contract. And, um, I, I have some resources that I'll provide to you. There's a, a list of a lot of different ways that, that you can, that are checks and balances to, to kind of protect yourself, but it starts with, with communication. So what that looks like is going to be having your contract clearly spelled out. And I would always advise on going overboard. If you, you know, and if, if you have to go more information or less, always go with more spell out the dates, spell out when payments are due. Is there a down payment? Is there a payment plan after that? Is it, uh, you know, is it contingent on certain things happening? And then you said earlier, are there things that are out of your control that could arise, address those things in the contract and, and just, just put them right in there. If there's weather, you know, that happens for an outdoor event, it, what happens then? Do you, you know, is that on, the business owner to, to take care of, or is that just, you know, that's mother nature, but you have to, you have to agree on that. And so that's one example of a detail that you should have a clause in your contract and, and clearly 
spell that sort of thing out so that if a chargeback comes through, you've you've both already addressed that instead of the he said, she said argument uh, that, that would uh, most likely ensue. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and any fan of this show knows that I am a huge proponent of contract language, specifically when it comes to refunding or not refunding in this instance, deposits, retainers, non-refundable payments. I mean, I speak the gospel of make sure that your contract is clear in those terms. So is there anything else that we that you can speak to with regard to these variables that allow the, the business owner to, to fight the chargeback successfully? So we've got, in, in one instance, we have, first of all, have a contract. Second of all, sure. make sure the contract addresses the issues in which the dispute involves. What else can we do? So other other things that are going to fall under that that general category of be clear is it, you know things like posting posting your terms and conditions your refund policy your privacy policy all of the the legal stuff of your business put it on your website put it uh, in your email in your contracts of course um, send all of that information and get it in the hands of your of your client other than just, you know in addition to obviously verbally telling them about that sort of thing. So um, post all of those, be clear, we talked about that. If there's uh, things outside of your control, address those, uh, make sure that they're in there. And then um, one other little thing that, that comes up a lot is make sure that the billing itself is is clear in terms of the actual dollar amount when, when invoices are sent, or if you're charging for uh, one payment in a series of three payments, let's just say, it, when when it comes time to charge payment number two, giving your customers a, a, a courtesy email or a reminder or something like that to just say, hey, payment number two of $500 is coming up. We're going to charge that card at noon tomorrow. Just wanted to let you know. Email, then send them a receipt and, and just make sure you're covering all of your tracks like that. So email receipts, Text receipts in some case, depending on the software that you're using, that's possible. Um, and, and so, you know, making sure once again, this ties back to clarity, make sure your customer knows that it's you and your company doing the billing and that they are clear on when and how much they're going to be charged so that they're not caught off guard and, you know, they, they're, they're not accepting a payment that they didn't think they were going to have to make. That makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so and th this might be something that I, I don't know. I'm just throwing this out there. So if if one of the main the, the main drivers of whether or not the business owner is going to win the chargeback dispute is having contract that has the necessary wording, showing evidence that the, the terms and conditions and that language had been communicated through the contract itself, but also through receipts, the language on email communications and all that is provided to the merchant services provider as they're evaluating that wouldn't that necessarily mean that 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 somebody on the merchant services side is either an attorney or is having to read these legal documents and make almost a legal decision in many instances so can you kind of elaborate on that or like what's what's going on behind the scenes do we know um to, to some degree, I'd agree with you. Yeah, I mean, it, definitely it's their legal department department that are putting the, the, the policies in place on behalf of the bank and the merchant services company. I, I obviously can't speak to the, the nuances of it. I, I don't. Yeah, I was just throwing a shot it. off the bow, man. I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, all, all that comes into play. But I will also add that that just made me think of something else that, you know, the, the sort of merchant account credit worthiness of the business also comes into play and could be a factor just the same as the credit worthiness of the consumer when, when that gets played it, you know, because with, generally with a merchant account, you have a chargeback ratio that you have to keep, you know, within, which is just a, a obviously a, a general score as to whether you as a business, you're providing good measures and good services to your customers that less than 1% of your, your customers are sure. happy. So kind of like we want to make sure that on either side, either the consumer side or the business side, you're not some kind of grifter. So if you've got a history of I've got 100, 100 chargebacks that I've made in the past month, I, I'm a grifter, right? So exactly. I, I get that. That makes sense. 
Um, exactly. Well, Brian, you've, you've touched on a lot of things and um, with regard to fighting, and I'm sure that some of this overlaps, but is there anything just going forward for the wedding or event professional to do um, to minimize the risk of chargeback or minimize the success that somebody might have with a chargeback against them in the future? Yeah, uh, there's... I, I mentioned it earlier, but I'll, I'll give you a link to put in the description. There, there's a, a PDF and a, a, a website article that gives a bunch of best practices that are just little things. That, that would be my recommendations. Uh, some of the things are specific to using certain software that's very easy to get with merchant accounts like 3D Secure and uh, encrypt, different encryption and secure payment pages and things like that that covers all kinds of fraud and chargebacks in general. And I'll, I'll give that to you because in general, a lot of this stuff is fairly easy to implement. You just got to know to implement it and, and set it up. Some of the stuff can be automated in terms of the billing and everything like that. Those reminders I talked about, some of that stuff can be uh you know, automated. And again, that goes back to the software, but uh, that would be a reference or a, a resource that I would, I would point your uh, viewers and listeners over to, to, to check out. And that um, PDF that Brian is referencing will be in the show notes um, and in the description of the video. If you want to click on that, it's a great resource. Brian's uh, YouTube channel is also an exceptional resource with, with all things merchant services, accepting credit cards, taking payments online. He is a guru. That's why I'm so happy that he's uh, come on to the show for the second time to talk to us. Um, Brian, kind of give us your spiel. Like how, what, what can you do for, for pr professionals taking payments online or debit and credit cards? What, what do you do for, for, for them? Kind of give us a shout out. Yeah, yeah. So we, I, I do all things payments. As you said, we set up merchant accounts. We help manage them. We we do mobile payments, retail, and online. And so depending on how your business operates, um, you know, we'll I'll talk with you first. We'll do a, a consultation and, and go through all of the 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 ways that you collect payments and and kind of tailor it the the solution to to what's right for your business because there's so much software these days, so much hardware as well. Um, you know, we, I'll go through that with you and, and talk with you about it. And then we set up the merchant account, manage it, make sure rates are good, all this chargeback stuff, you know, I, we'll take care of all of that for you. And just, and we talked about this just really quickly. I'm sorry, but we talked about this in the last video for all you, all the, all the listeners or the, or the viewers out there that, um, Many of you, as as you know, are using um, HoneyBook or or I think Owl Planner. These these type of one, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, like a turnkey content client management payment system. But you can, if you so choose, talk to somebody like Brian. Specifically, talk to Brian about accepting payments apart from those systems. You could potentially get a better deal on the processing fees that you pay you could get um, better education on terms of how to make these things safer how to um, like he said you he will have resources a whole host of resources about um, minimizing the chances of chargeback. So do please seek out Brian. He, the link in the show description will also have a consultation link and Brian, cl correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have a, you do a, a free initial consultation. Um, that's about 20 minutes or so. Right. Yep. Yeah. My, as, as my calendar permits, I, I, yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't blow him up back not two in the morning, but you know, during business right. hours, if he's got time, he'll talk to you. So Absolutely. please seek out yep. Brian's counsel. He's an he, exceptional resource. We're so happy to have him on Brian. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thanks again, Rob. All right. Well, I hope that you found this video highly informative. I hope also that you are well on your way to fulfilling all of your New Year's resolutions. One of your New Year's resolutions should be to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel or like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. And of course, as always, please be sure to let me know if I've said something dumb. If you have suggestions for content, I will address them all. Um, I appreciate any feedback. Any feedback is good for the five people out there listening. Let me know that you're out there. Let me hear you. New videos every Monday. And with that, folks, we'll see you next time.